Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Ford, Director of Programming at Vermont PBS and host of the Made Here series on Thursdays as well. Welcome to this special event showcasing the winning films and filmmakers of the inaugural Made Here Film Festival, which is a program of VTIF. We hope you enjoyed watching these films from Northern New England and Quebec. And if you have any questions for the filmmakers that you see here today, please type them into the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and let's get started. Let me introduce our, our special guests. Up first is Paul Kimich from Vermont. He's the co-winner of the VTIF Award for Best Fiction Film with his film, Stay for Tea. Hi, Paul. Hello, thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Great. Up next, we have Sarah Bordeaux from Quebec, also the co-winner of the VTIF Award for Best Fiction Film with her film, Rosalind Likes, like, like in the Movies. Hi, oh. Sarah. Welcome. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Great to see you. Uh, we have uh, Anita Clearfield and Jeffrey Layton from Maine, uh, winners of the Vermont PBS Award for Best Documentary for their film, Natasha Mayers and Unstill Life. Hello, Jeffrey. Hey. Thanks Hi, for Anita. having us. Thanks for being here. And we also have uh, Maya Voda uh, from Vermont who is a recipient of the Goldstone Award for Most Promising Newcomer, sponsored by Bill Stetson uh, for her film, Yellow Cards for Equal Pay. Hi, Maya. Hi, thanks, Eric. Thanks for being here. And last but not least, we have Matteo Moretti, who is an almost graduate of Middlebury College, very close, few more weeks, uh, whose film, Just Being Here, won the Media Factory Audience Favorite Award. So, um, hi, Matteo. Hi, thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, we'll get started. We, uh, we have a lot of folks and I'm sure there's a lot of great questions out there. Um, first of all, I just want to say congratulations to everyone for, um, for being part of the festival and, and winning awards with your films. They were all amazing and they're all just different and unique in their own way. And it's just um, really a wealth of, of interesting subjects um, and, and themes in the film. So it's just it was great to see them all back to back like this is really wonderful. Um, I thought I would start out with just a general question for everyone. Um, you know, here we are coming out of over a year plus in a pandemic. So I'm just wondering how, you know, being in this space in this time affected the film that you make? Did it affect the film that you make? Did it affect the subject that you chose? You know, what was the impact there, um, you know, in this in this time, I mean, we know kind of what's happened, um, you know, internationally with filmmaking. A lot of things are on pause or on hold, and just wondering if if that if that somehow shaped um, the film that you ended up making at all. Um, so, you know, I'll I'll throw that out to anyone if you wanna if you wanna start. Um, I can go because it really influenced uh, not the film that I uh, showed at the festival, but uh, the next film I'm going to do. Um, the first time I got out of Montreal City after six months, I was so amazed to see the landscape that this feeling of discovering the land again and the horizon really inspired me for the next movie. And it's really the confinement and being outside and go out really influenced me for the next one. Well, that's great. I mean, Paul, you, I mean, I, th I feel like that was a, perhaps a factor in your film, the pandemic. Is that the case? Yeah, absolutely. The, um, our film that my father and I made, it was a, a vague idea that we had kind of talked about for a while about this old man with dementia and the, you know, the Polish connection. And then pretty much fundamentally because of quarantine, uh, we were in the house together and, we said, okay, we have this kind of equipment, we have this house, um, and we just kind of came up with it and we started filming it. And I thought it was gonna be like five minutes. It turned out to be much longer and we just, it kind of snowballed. And we wouldn't have made the film had it not been for us being together, imprisoned uh, in the home. And um, I obviously wish COVID didn't happen, but without quarantine kicking us in the butt, we wouldn't have made the movie. Um, it was exactly that condition that that was the catalyst for it. Yeah. Well, we've got a question here um, from the audience, actually, for Matteo, um, wondering how you came to make this film and how you came up with the subject. So I'm just wondering, maybe that was because of the pandemic. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you for that question. I think it 
it's pretty much exactly a product of the pandemic. Um, you know, there was a bunch of different ideas that I had going into my senior year because that was my senior film thesis. Um, and, you know, all of those kind of got blown up and I got back to campus in the fall and there's a lot of restrictions. Um, and I really wanted to create a film about someone that lived an uh, inherently isolated life pre-COVID as a way to kind of like be in conversation with COVID, but also to kind of like make a film that could stand outside of COVID as well. But for me, it, um, it was definitely interesting because like I had to just do like one man team the entire time. Um, and it definitely allowed me to get closer to Walter. And I think that just one-on-one -on -one helped create a lot more intimate of a film um, and ultimately like created a friendship. And that's what I think really helped with the film. Um, but yeah, I kind of just met Walter by chance and you know, ended up making a friend because I was up there almost four to five times a week um, for about a month and a half. So, yeah. Oh, that's really, it's really interesting. Thanks for, for that uh, insight. Maya, I know your film, I believe your film was made before the pandemic started. And so I'm just wondering, I mean, you're in college now, you know, are you making other films or has this impacted what you've um, been up to? Yeah, I was sort of putting the finishing touches on my film and editing right when the pandemic hit. So I was, I got pretty lucky there. Um, I would definitely say it's affected my future projects. So I had some ideas for some stuff that I wanted to do. And I mean, similar to what other people have said, just kind of had to put everything on hold and um, I ended up being able to do this like Zoom interview series with a bunch of women that work in the film industry that um, was sort of like, you know, something that I wouldn't have done otherwise, but um, it was great to, you know, have the opportunity being, you know, stuck in isolation and, you know, I wouldn't have been able to interview people across the country in person anyway. So it was uh, nice to just uh, find something new to do in such a, a new situation. Anita and Jeffrey, you've been making films for decades and in Maine, you know, how has this impacted you and your work? Making films for decades? Um, um, I think that it, it's, it's really interesting because um, the Natasha Mayer's film uh, took about four years. And so the pandemic piece wasn't a big piece of it. But I think one of the real driving forces was the changing political climate. And the, the constant feeling that we need to do something and that she's sort of this um, spokesperson for activism and um, being a part of your community and affecting change. And I think it was the environment over the last four years that really pushed us to that. And then of course, having the pandemic just gave us a lot more time to finish it up and argue with each other. So <laughs> it's like, right? Point. Yeah, no, it was it. Um, it definitely allowed us to finish it where we could really bring it to a conclusion and have the time to edit. And, you know, it's a project we do kind of on the side, and so it was really like, oh, now we can do this. So, yeah, I mean, maybe one of those po those positive moments, right, from the pandemic is the ability to focus in on on project work. So yeah. that's great. Um, question for so for Sarah and Paul, the two fiction films in the showcase tonight, um, both in black and white, you know, so is it coincidental, perhaps, but um, I'm wondering if, if both of you could maybe talk a little bit about that choice that you make, because that's not a choice that that everyone makes these days. Sarah, by all means. Uh, me, me, I am. But I, I'm I'm a huge fan of color, so yes, it for me it was a thing. But because it's a film on film, it was it just imposed itself to make it black and white because it's the first color of film. So I guess I went to that because it's a film in a film. So it was just obvious to go on that direction. And Paul, and the other similar, uh, similarity with Paul, we have older characters also. That's a, and I really like that because often fiction shows young people, and I think it's great to put the people who had lived more on screen. So, don't go with that, Paul. What about you? Yeah. Um, 
so the I have always been a fan of you know black and white films in general and and the kind of like cliche of Eastern European films, European films in black and white, you know, Bergman and Tarkovsky. And um, I like the idea that I was wanted to make a film that that was simple in, in, in a few ways. And I like the idea of just getting rid of color um, and having the feeling that you have when you watch a, a Bergman film or a Tarkovsky film and you're reducing that uh, that spectrum. It's just not there. And it felt right because um, we're talking about a man who's trying to figure out who he is. And so color doesn't need to be there to distract the viewer from what's happening internally with his experience. And and then just purely superficially, it's just, I like black and white and the house looks good in black and white. Um, that's, yeah. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the inspiration can come from anything, right? And And so, what, what fits the project best, right? Um, this is a question from the audience for Sarah, um, but I, you know, I guess I would pose this to, to anyone here as well, but we can start with Sarah. Um, what have you done since you made uh, your film that we just saw? Uh, and have you made uh, you know, other short films? Um, uh, yeah, I made too many short films. I should move on to the feature film. Um, my I made maybe 10 short films and I'm moving on the feature film. I'm working on it. So that's the next thing. And I also going to make a short film and the pandemic really, I, I kind of like the pandemic mood because you're missing nothing. You know, you're missing nothing. So you can work home. And as a scriptwriter, we already wearing pajamas all day. So it's kind of never <laughs> pursuing the, the, the thing. So um, yeah, I made many short. I'm, keep on going and I hope to move on to the future film soon but I found the structure of long uh, very hard after making so many, many short where you you structure your mind to to be uh, fast and quick on how you tell the story it's hard to move to the to the next so um, you'll see <laughs> <laughs> so for um, Maya and Mateo, Mateo just wrapping up college, Maya's entered college, you know, probably, um, you know, <laughs> considering everything that's going on, maybe hard to say, but what, what do you, uh, what's coming up next for you, film or otherwise? Maya, uh, you can go for it. <laughs> um, I've pretty much just been in school. I know that's like the boring answer, um, <laughs> but I have, I've been working on the, um, the next thing I did after my film here was work on the interview series I mentioned before, which was really, really fun. Just like eight different um, a series of um, Zoom interviews um, with a bunch of women in the film industry, you know, directors, producers, writers, editors, everybody. Um, and I think it was really fun. It definitely pushed me out of my comfort zone made me have to, you know, become a better interviewer, which I was not totally prepared for, I think. Um, but I learned a lot and um, it was exciting to really do something different, but I think, I think I'm ready and I'm hopefully going to jump back into a short film soon, but I don't know too much about that yet. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and for me, I, uh, I've been trying to like take it easy, you know, enjoying senior spring, but um, recently I DP'd my friends senior thesis, which is like a fiction film, which is a lot different or a narrative film, which is a lot different than like documentary stuff that I normally focus on. Um, but after graduation, I will be moving out to Colorado to go um, pursue like freelance filmmaking and editing, but also to assist a freelance like outdoor documentary filmmaker in Colorado. Wow, that sounds exciting. Yeah, I'm <laughs> really excited about it. Great. Anita and Jeffrey, what's up? What are you working on now or what's up next for you? Well, a big part of um, the Natasha Mayer's film is the distribution itself. Um, you know, just like Natasha talks about uh, activism in her life, where the art, it's not just the content of the art that makes it activist, it's that she gets people involved and it's that democratization that anybody can do it, you too can do it, get involved. And so in the same way, we don't want the film to just be a passive watch the film and go home kind of thing. We want it to be something that can be used. So we're really hoping that groups will contact us, organizations, 
nonprofits who would like to use the film to show it to either raise money for their own work or for a cause that they believe in. And we actually have some funding that we've gotten from the Maine Community Foundation to uh, fund ART, the Artist Rapid Response Team, to send out their banners to organizations who are showing the film. And we've worked with someone to create a discussion guide for communities so they can go into some of these questions that the film raises. And we've worked with an educator who's come up with a really great curriculum. So there's all kinds of ways that people can use the film to activate community. So that's kind of what we're doing now where we're going out and creating this whole impact campaign. Um, so that making the film was nothing compared to what we're gonna <laughs> yeah. do next. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a really great point. You know, it's not just, um, you know, all the labor that goes into making the film. It's what you do with it after. Right. And it's a very different path for for, for everyone. Um, so that's a, a great, great point for people to understand. Paul, what about you? What are you um, what are you working on now or next? How I can get that unemployment money. <laughs> um, no. So right now I'm um, just doing freelance gigs and I'm helping produce <clears throat> my friend's film. He's a student here at, in, in Vermont and he's making a feature film. So I'll be producing that alongside of him. Um, I have suspended most of my own personal, you know, film uh, ideas for the meantime. There's a short film and a feature film that I'm, I'm trying to make happen, but with COVID and the length of the, the, the amount of people that are, involved in it or need to be involved in it it's just unrealistic at the time so right now i'm just working on his film and surviving and all of that paul oh, this was a question um from one of the folks um watching um you it, was your father an actor it, you know was he trained as an actor no i mean so yes and no my my father um he he was he was a film student and Emerson in the uh, the late sixties early seventies and he also went to um, Suffolk and BU and he was around actors and he acted a little bit here and there but he was never he never studied as an actor um, but uh, he can act and um, he's acted for me before and, and and for other friends of mine for their films. And um, he's quite a good actor. <clears throat> and um, he was certainly excited to do this, um, but in, in no by means, you know, he's never had formal training, but he gets it. And, you know, our family is, a, the family I come from is a ballet and, and, and musical children's theater. And he owned a theater company for some time and co-runs a, a children's theater now with my mother. And so he's been surrounded by it his whole life. So I think that was what helped him, um, his, his knowledge of it and watching people direct and act, he was able to you know, perform the way that he, he did for the film. That's fantastic. Sarah, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the star of your film. I, I, what, I find it so interesting. It's, I love films from Quebec, first of all, just because I feel like, especially in the States, people don't really get a chance to see them as much, I think. Um, and so, I don't know, I wonder if you could, I mean, the amazing performances, but I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your star. Uh, yeah, the, but the star, she's not only the star, in fact, she, she wrote the short story, Rosalind, and she's the one who approached me to adapt it to a, a film, so it's kind of a, a story that she wrote also. So um, the star of the this film, like she's really an, a special woman. With she's a big actress here, so she wanted she dream of see one of her short story adapt. So, but the story is also about an actor, and she told me that as an actress, many times she have played role that at the same time was a, was having a reflection of, on their life. Like, uh, I don't know. I'm sorry for my English. I haven't speak English in so long. <laughs> but it makes it that thick for you. Uh, it's a big French accent. <laughs> so, uh, yes, it's, it's her story. She asked me to, do, to write the film. And she's just so amazing. Like, the shot that called, you said, like, but you said, ah, oh, she's good. But when, when she do her monologue, like, we, we did one take. It was really no noisy on the set. 
and she, she said, we'll do another one. And after she did this amazing thing when magic happened, like even you look at the technician and like we all feel something. So she's just great. Like she's just magic. And I don't know, it's something in the eyes of the actor, you know, when a good, act, a good actor, you can feel his emotion only by his eyes, I think. So that's what she did. So is that answering the question? Yeah, no, it's great. And your English is, is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just, so, you know, acting the, the folks that we see on screen, obviously a big piece of the film, the, the, the final product. I wanted to ask folks just in general about sound and music because it's, su it's such a vital piece of your films and everyone had a different approach to that. So I wanted to throw that out there and just if folks wanted to talk about how you used, how you approached the use of sound uh, and music in, in your films. So I'll just go ahead and throw that out to, to the group here. I'll, I'll, I'll jump because I already have my answer. I, I'm not a huge, fa huge fan of the sound that push the, emo the emotion. I think the sound need to complete something, like not to like put their marker on it. So I think sounds, it's something you, it can be so powerful and it can uh, put pull down your emotion. So it, me, I, I put a lot, a lot of work as much as the, the image, I think as much as the sound as the image. It, so that's my own. Mateo, tell me about your the, the the music in your film. Was it composed for for the film? Yeah. So I, as you know, still this is like my first film. I initially I kind of like jam packed it with music, and my one of my professors was like, "What are you doing?" Like I love sound design because I come from like making outdoor like fly fishing videos. So I like am obsessed with sound design. He's like, "You're good at that." Like you have the soundscape, it's great. Like don't pack it with music, use it really intentionally. Um, so I did that and it just like opened up like the breadth of the film so much. And it meant even more to me to answer your question, Eric, that I had my brother who's like an extremely talented pianist um, compose like the main kind of ending piece of score for it. Um, and it was just kind of a cool experience to like sit down with him when I was at home over break after I'd shot everything. I was like, this is what I want. Like I had the sequence kind of in my head and he kind of just sat down and he's absolutely brilliant. And within like five minutes, he was like, okay, I got it. He recorded it and it was just like perfect. And for me, like really made the film and just kind of like emphasized how Walter was feeling at that critical moment. Um, and also like as only one of three pieces of score in the entire thing, like it was just important to me personally that it was my brother, but also that it just like matched exactly what I wanted it to do. So, yeah. That's great. Um, Paul, you know, obviously right from the, the get-go in your film, the sound design is so key to setting the mood. You know, can you talk a little bit about, about that and how you, kind of plan for that and, and what you were you were thinking about that design. Yeah, sure. Um, so the sound was really important because I knew that I was going to have to ADR the entire film. So everything was going to have to be, you know, second recording. So um, everything. So my father would speak and then later on he would redo his dialogue into a microphone. Um, all the room tone because we, the house is situated on a very busy road. So all of the sound has like going by. And so we had to do that. But then when it comes more to the, the, the creative aspects of the sound design, I wanted to try to capture what it was like for someone who never has a lucid moment, you know, um, someone who's constantly in a foggy brain, but then once in a while they get a little, ding, they have that, the light bulb goes off. They remember who they are. They're escaping the, that, that moment of dementia. And so I thought of bells, glass, um, filaments uh, inside of light bulbs, shaking around just to try to um, embody what is happening inside of his mind 
um, uh, you know, these ideas of clarity, these moments of clarity that he's having. Um, so that was fun to play with, sampling um, dings and, 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 and various uh, metal and, and glass sounds and kind of piecing them together. And I realized while I was doing it, what because we would shoot during the day and, and then I would edit immediately in the evening and that was our schedule, I was kind of piecing it together and I thought I was going to have to compose music or, or find someone to do so. And just these bells and chimes kind of started working and it became this motif and I kind of started playing around with it. And I didn't need music uh, except for, you know, the, 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 the Polish anthem that happens during the film. But outside of that, I was like, we we're fine with weird little dings and blings and things like this. This will be well, this will be good. So, um, and then outside of that thematic aspect that those motifs and whatnot, it was mostly trying to, to capture the moments where you shift from what's happening objectively to what's happening hyper subjectively. And the idea of your brain, the actual, your physical brain, um, what's happening with dementia, kind of this underwater sound effect and these muffled things coming up that that was fun to play with. And I, I based a lot of the sounds I was sampling off of documentaries I was watching about, uh, people suffering from dementia and what they were saying they were experiencing. Um, yeah, so that's, that's that. Great. Oh, it's really interesting to hear that. Uh, question for Anita and Jeffrey switching gears. Um, animation in your film, so wonderful. And it's such a fun part, um, uh, you know, of the visual style of your film. Wondering if you could talk, a little bit about how that came to be, you know, how you worked with the animation in your film. Uh, well, I think one of the, go ahead. No, uh, no you go you ahead. Go. No, yeah, no. okay, okay. Um, <laughs> I think that the, one of the things that we were going for was this feeling of almost a magical realism, the, the kind of connection that Natasha has with her paintings and to some extent, you know, she she works and lives by herself. So these um, the paintings coming alive with figures are sort of the figures she wrestles with each day when she's doing her paintings. And um, a lot of it is rotoscoped. Um, we also did some motion tracking and and things like that that. Um, really were more to give it this uh, every once in a while to raise the kind of sort of that it's fun, but also at the same time that these are um, demons that a painter has to wrestle with. And so that, that was kind of what we were going for. And I have a, a lot of background in animation and it, it really helps for me, it really helps documentaries to be able to have moments of subjectivity in the middle of objectivity. Well. Yeah, and just to add on to that, um, we, we wanted the style of Natasha too. So that kind of painterly thing, you know, where even though it would take longer to rotoscope it with, the, you know, a lot of brushwork, we, we did that so that it would come out with that kind of feeling. That's great. That really interesting insights. Uh, I have time for just, I have one last really quick question and then we're, we're almost out of time. This one was for Mateo. Um, just wondering about the beavers. Like what happened? Are they still there? Did they come back? Yeah. Any updates? Um, that's, that's what I was wondering, you know, the whole time after I left November and December. Um, but I am happy to say that a few of them are still there. Um, I got an email from Walter the other day with a little update. I'm going to be going up there to like help him chop some firewood, but some of the beavers are still there. A few have moved away. Um, and he's just kind of hoping they'll stick around They're Like he said, they're running out of food. So, you know, it could be any day that they might just go, but as, as of right now, they're, they're still there. Well, that's good to hear. That's a nice, nice note to end on. Um, I want to thank everyone here for their time. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your films with us. 
and your insights. Thank you. And uh, thanks to all the folks that stuck around to listen. It's, it's been a great, a great discussion. Um, these films will be shown again in person at the VTIF Festival in Burlington uh, in October, which is exciting. People will get another chance to hopefully see them together in, a, in an actual theater, which is really exciting. I can't wait for that myself. And uh, hopefully they'll be playing in other places. And in fact, maybe on Vermont PBS, we'll see. Um, so thanks again and have a great evening, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.